This video lecture is meant to cover the information in Chapter 5, Sections 1 and Sections 3, uh, covering Bohr's model of the atom and atomic spectra. We've seen in Chapter 4 the Dalton model, the Thomson model, and the Rutherford model. The next step in the evolution of the atomic uh, theories of the next step in the evolution of the idea of the atom, that's what I meant to say, is uh, Bohr's model of the atom. In the Rutherford model, we have this positively charged massive nucleus surrounded by electrons just sort of whizzing about randomly. But Bohr says they're not really random, that the electrons are traveling in these very specific concentric circular paths, and that those electrons can either be on one of those paths either at the lowest energy level available, or those electrons can move between those uh, orbits, but they cannot exist in the space between the orbits. And he came up with this idea after seeing uh, flame tests, which you may or may not have had the chance to do uh, before you hear this lecture, uh, but if you burn different metal salts in the Bunsen burner, or if you energize them with electricity, they give off different colors. These different colors are seen in very dramatic fashion um, when you see firework shows. Bohr questioned a couple things about atomic structure and about Rutherford's model of the atom. He knew that electrons were negative and that the nucleus was positive. So why didn't the negative electrons go crashing, spiraling inward towards that positive nucleus? What kept the electrons out in orbit? What, what kept the atoms from, from sort of crumbling and, and, and collapsing in on itself? Well, he proposed that electrons move around the planet, move around the nucleus like planets around the sun, and that if these are the electrons, the green dots, they'll travel in these circular paths um, like planets around the sun. In order for an electron to be in this orbit compared to the next orbit out, that re would require a very specific amount of energy for an electron to travel between orbits. Let's say it took um, 100 joules of energy to go from this inner orbit to an outer orbit. If the electron was given only 50 joules of energy, that electron could not move halfway. It would have to stay in this in this orbit where it is. It would have to have at least 100 joules in order for it to go up to the next energy level. So very specific amounts of energy separate one electron level or orbit from one another. In 1913, a Danish scientist by the name of Niels Bohr improved upon Rutherford's model of the atom. While Rutherford proposed that negatively charged electrons were held in orbit by the positively charged nucleus, he did not describe the location of the electrons. Niels Bohr proposed that electrons move in orbits around the nucleus. And he proposed that these orbital paths, or energy levels, are located at various distances from the nucleus. Today, we refer to Bohr's theory as the Bohr model of the atom. So here's the diagram of Bohr's model from the book. Again, the positive, positively charged nucleus. The electrons are in the circular paths that are called orbits. And in order for this electron to move between orbits, a very specific, definite amount of energy would have to be absorbed to go from this inner orbit to this outer orbit. So energy, um, Bohr's model is said to have energy levels, kind of like layers of an onion. Kind of like layers of an onion. Sorry, I went too far too fast on that. And the electron has more energy the further it is from the nucleus. So this inner circular orbit is what we call ground state, the lowest energy level available. You should write down that definition. Ground state is when the energy, when the electron is in the lowest energy level available. Um, but if it were to absorb a specific amount of energy and jump to this higher level of uh, 
a higher level of energy, then we would say this electron up here is in the excited state. So an excited state is when an electron is um, in a higher energy level than it normally would be. We say that the electron's energy is quantized, meaning it's, it's got a very specific quantity that can be measured uh, about it. And so this is where you, you might have heard the term that the, the, we're kind of heading towards the idea of the quantum mechanical model. And so the idea that there's a very quantized amount of energy associated with electrons. Well, what does this have to all do with the flame tests and the atomic spectra that um, you may or may not have seen yet, but will see uh, later on in this chapter if you haven't already? Uh, well, to understand that, we have to first understand a little something about electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is anything from radio waves to microwaves, infrared radiation, better known as heat, visible light, which can be separated out into the colors of the rainbow, ultraviolet, of course, this is UV radiation that we are supposed to use sunblock to keep us from burning our skin, to x-rays, to gamma rays. So it might be evident that if you see this, uh, you, you might have this intuitive understanding that this gamma ray end of this spectrum is the high energy end, and the radio in the microwaves is the low energy end of this spectrum. And so visible light sort of in the middle, if we were to separate out visible light into the component colors, and I know that your hand your handout is not in color, so you should probably indicate that these are the Roy, well, I didn't quite put the yellow over the yellow, but the Roy G Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, follows that same pattern. So the red end of the spectrum is the low energy end, and the violet end is the high energy end. You can see here some terms that we're going to define later on, but this distance right here of this microwave end, that's what we call a wavelength. And if you look down at the, the right-hand end, the wavelength gets much shorter. So as we see energy increasing, the wavelength is decreasing. So shorter wavelengths means a higher energy. And so here that would be same the same would be true for violet light. Violet light will have a shorter wavelength which results in a higher energy. Red light will have a longer wavelength which means it has a lower energy. Now white light which comes from the kind of light bulb that you see pictured here. This is called an incandescent bulb and it produces a white light which we can then take that white light right here and pass it through a prism. Prism is a special piece of glass that can take white light. It bends the white light. That's a fancy term called refraction. It refracts the light. And each one of those wavelengths of color bends at a different angle. And effectively, it separates the white light into the colors of the rainbow. As you can see here from this graphic, you might recognize it from the Pink Floyd uh, album cover. Um, seen here. This is how we know white light is made up of all the colors of the visible spectrum, the Roy G. Biv colors, because we can take that white light and break it down with a prism. You can pass that white light through that prism to separate the light into a rainbow. This rainbow right here is called a continuous spectrum because one color of light blends right into the next light. There's no separation of colors. In fact, it's kind of hard to tell where the red ends and the, and the orange begins. You can't really tell where the orange ends and the yellow begins. Okay, it's called a continuous spectrum. So what happens if you take light that is not white and pass it through a spectrum? If you pass it, or if you pass it through a prism, I mean. What happens then? Will you get that continuous rainbow? And that's what you're going to see with the atomic spectra lab, where you're going to use a special device called the spectroscope which has a, a little diffraction grating in the eyepiece, which is a, it does the same thing as a glass prism. It takes the colors of light coming in and it breaks them, it bends them in, in different angles, and we it separates out the colors of light, and you'll see something very different that happens. 
So if the light is not white, as seen here in this purple colored flame, the purple light goes into the prism, it bends the purple light into its component colors, and we see here that you do not get a continuous spectrum. You get bands of color. Okay, so by energizing a gas or by energizing this metal salts like we did in the flame test lab, you can get it to give off to get it to give off certain colors. If you pass that light through a prism, something different happens. Each element gives off its own characteristic colors as seen here by these bands. There's two different shades of red, so two different shades of blue, and two different shades of purple here in this diagram. And this is actually how um, we know that stars are made up of um, different elements. But here, it's, so we can use this this tool to identify the elements that are present, whether it's in the flame that we're burning or whether or not it's in the star up in the up in the sky. When you look at these different elements with a spectroscope, you will see a pattern like this. Let's turn our attention to this top one right here. This is hydrogen and across the top here 400, 500, 600, 700, those are, that's the, the wavelength of the light. This is 400 nanometers, this is 700 nanometers. Notice that the um, shorter wavelength is the purple end, meaning the higher energy end, and the 700 end, that's a longer wavelength, so that's a lower energy end. So these pictures that you see here are actually flipped from the diagram that we saw a few slides ago. But if you were to look at hydrogen with a spectroscope, um, and I mean when I say hydrogen, I'm referring to hydrogen being um, energized either with electricity or by a flame, it would then, you would see it in the spectroscope as a band of purple, a band of blue, a band of green, and a band of red. And that's a very distinct pattern for hydrogen. Here is the pattern in the middle for mercury, and here is the pattern for neon. So every element gives off its own unique pattern of light bands, and it's essentially like a fingerprint. And that's how we can identify it, because each pattern is different. It's kind of cool. So what does this really have to all do with atomic structure? How does this explain where the electrons are? Well, here we have this, this blue arch thing that you're looking at. is meant to represent a, a, a part of an atom. This very center right here is where the nucleus would be. This red dot that I can move around, that's an electron. And we see here the different levels um, where you can find electrons. These are essentially the, the concentric circular orbits where the electron can exist. So this electron here being in the first circle, the lowest energy level available, this is what we would call ground state. This electron is, and if I were to continue circling around here, this electron can only live on this orbital. Um, it can't be in between or closer in. It will stay on this circular path as long as it's in ground state. But if we were to energize this electron either with electricity or with a Bunsen burner. So here we have, here's my representation of, <clears throat> excuse me, of energy being absorbed by the electron. If we then energize this electron, we could force this electron to jump up to this next energy level, or maybe even if it absorbed even more energy, it could jump up to this level or this level or heck even up to here. Okay, so there's kind of a, a number of possibilities, but it would have to absorb enough energy. There would have to be enough energy given to the atom in order for it to do that. So this would be ground state, but any one of these orbits, well, let's not move the atom, let's move the electron. Any one of these orbits would be excited state. But here's the thing, the electron can't stay in these excited states they immediately want to get back to, um, to ground state because that's just the more stable place for the atom to be. So as the electron moves down, it could do a number of cascades. It could cascade down to each orbit, or it could do one major dive bomb and it could go straight down. Well, each one of those falls back down translates to a different amount of energy being emitted those different amounts of energy being emitted we see as a different color of light. For example, and I'll try to simplify this, 
if this electron were to jump to this energy level here, okay, if it were energized, we had energized it, and it came up to that level, then when it fell back down here, that's not a very big jump, so that would translate to a relatively small amount of energy. Okay, so that jump might emit a, um, a red photon of light okay, with a very long wavelength, and that's fairly low energy. So again, that represents this jump down to here. But let's say this electron gets energized and it goes up to this level, the third energy level. When that electron jumps back down to ground state, we'll consider the big jump, not the intermediate jump, but that jump from the third to the first energy level is a little bit more energy than the red wavelength. It might be, you might see that as a green light. Okay, I'm going to make this come out a little bit differently so it, it separates it a little bit. Okay, so the jump from the third down to the first is definitely a bigger jump. It's going to have higher energy. So the wavelength is a little bit shorter, and we see that as a higher energy color, in this case maybe green. But what if this electron is energized and it jumps all the way up to the fourth energy level? Well, in this excited state, when it were to, if it were to jump back down to ground state, that's a pretty big jump. That might translate to a much higher energy. We would see it potentially as a blue light. So looking at this through a, a spectroscope, you would see three individual colors or bands of light, a blue, a red, and a green. Um, of course, if you're not looking at... Um, at the light with a spectroscope, all these lights would be blended together and it would be the mixture of those colors that that's what you would see in uh, the flame test. So the flame test doesn't separate out the colors, it actually mixes these three colors and you would see it as a single color of light. You would need the, you would need the prism or um, uh, a spectroscope to see the individual bands of light. A couple of definitions. We said uh, wavelength is the distance from crest to crest. If I were to draw that up here, the crest to the crest would be this distance right here. We saw earlier that um, on the radio end of the spectrum, that's a longer wavelength, and on the gamma end of the spectrum, that's a much shorter wavelength. Another term uh, that we're not going to get to too much, but just to give you a frame of reference, frequency how often a complete wave cycle passes by a fixed position. The end down here on the radio end, this is a low frequency. Gamma ray is high frequency. We're not going to talk about frequency too much, but that is something that you'll talk about in uh, when we get to physics. Okay, Mathematical relationships. We saw already that the gamma radiation end is the high energy end. Okay, So this is high energy on this end, and on the radio end, this is low energy. So how does that, um, how does that relate to these various quantities? Well, energy and wavelength. As the energy increases, okay, which means we're going from left to right on this diagram up above, what's happening to the wavelength? The wavelength is decreasing. We refer to this as, a, as an indirect relationship or an inverse relationship. It's hard to write with your mouth, okay? But that's an inverse relationship. Um, with an increase in energy, there is a decrease in wavelength. Or you could say it the other way around. With an increase in wavelength, there is a decrease in energy. We could talk about the wavelength and the frequency relationship. I'll mention it here briefly. With, an in, with a, uh, a decrease in wavelength, meaning uh, you're going from left to right on this diagram, there is an increase in frequency. And if we were to consider energy and frequency, an increase in energy moving left to right on this diagram is also an increase in frequency. So just some other relationships, but this is the one that I really want you to focus on right here is that as energy increases, the wavelength decreases. That's the one that, that I want you to be sure you know. We're going to use this equation to calculate the energy of a photon of light. What's a photon of light? 
Well, you remember in that diagram where I showed you the different colors of light, uh, light waves coming off? That's what we consider to be a photon. A photon is a packet of energy that's emitted when an electron falls from a high energy level to a low energy level. So describing the energy of that photon of light is done mathematically with this equation, E equals HC over lambda. H, uh, e is the amount of energy of the photon, and the unit is joules. H is a constant called Planck's constant, and it is a number that will always be the same. That's why they call it a constant. And that value is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. C is the speed of light at 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Also a constant. And lambda is the wavelength of light measured in meters. It must be in meters to cancel out with the meters in the speed of light. So let's try a few problems here. Red light given off in fireworks comes from salts such as strontium nitrate and strontium carbonate. Calculate the energy of a photon of this light whose wavelength is 650 nanometers. All right, so we're given the wavelength, but it's in nanometers. So your first job is to convert nanometers into meters. You're going to use that technique that we learned earlier this year where, where you're converting metric units. To do that, you'll set up a fraction bar. You'll put nanometers in the denominator so that it'll cancel with the nanometers unit in your 650 nanometers measurement. Unit of meters will go on the top of this fraction. Since one meter is bigger than one nanometer, we'll put the one next to the meter. And then we'll know that one meter contains one billion nanometers. Nanometers will cancel out, and your math in your calculator is 650 divided by 1 billion, and you get 6.50 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Now we can use that in our equation, E equals HC over lambda. It's essentially a plug-in. We now have three numbers to plug in. We know H, we know C, and now we know lambda. H is the given constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. We're going to multiply that by the speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We're going to divide that all by our wavelength of 6.50 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. And if we take a close look um, at all the units that cancel, seconds will cancel with seconds. Meters will cancel, cancel with meters, leaving us with joules, which is our unit that we wanted. Now, in your calculator, please make sure you include these parentheses so that we maintain the proper order of operations. My suggestion would be to multiply these two numbers while they're in parentheses, but then hit the equal sign before you hit the division sign, and then divide by the 6.50 times 10 to the negative seventh of a meter. If you don't do all that, it tends to be that your calculator messes up order of operations and you end up with the wrong answer. And I, of course, just want you to always be successful in calculating the correct answer. If you've done your math correctly, you should end up with the value 3.06 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. All right, once you're done feeling confident about this, let's try another problem. The blue color in fireworks is often achieved by heating copper 1 chloride to about 1200 degrees Celsius. Then the compound emits blue light having a wavelength of 450 nanometers. How much energy is emitted per photon? All right, I'm not going to step you through this problem, but the strategy. First, take that wavelength of 450 nanometers, convert it to meters. Once you've properly converted it to meters, you'll plug it into the equation E equals HC over lambda, where the meters wavelength will go in the denominator where the lambda is. Take a moment to calculate that answer now. When you're done, come back, unpause the video, and check your answer here, which is under this magical oval of blue. Go ahead, pause that video. Don't just wait for that answer. Okay, good. You paused the video. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the answer here. Hopefully, you got the same answer, 4.42 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Next problem. Microwave radiation has a wavelength on the order of 1.0 centimeters. Calculate the energy of a single photon of this radiation. 
same strategy, except now the only curveball here is I've given you the wavelength in centimeters, not nanometers. You still have to convert that wavelength of centimeters into meters before you can plug it into the energy equation. Take a moment to pause this video, try your work. When you have an answer, come back, check your answer. Got an answer? All right, here is the answer. Let's compare. 1.989 times 10 to the negative 23 joules. I realize my answer here doesn't have, it has more significant figures than it should, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that we were at least on the same wavelength. Huh? Got a joke for you on this one. That hopefully we're on the same wavelength, on the same page, getting the same answers uh, from our calculators. All right? We're going to be doing some more work with this in class, uh, but this is just a, to, a, to get us started and um, uh, with the Bohr model of the atom and uh, figuring out what all this atomic spectra data is telling us about the structure of the atom. This concludes this video lecture.